400 years of silence is a phrase that many people use to describe the period between the Old and New Testaments. In this case, the silence refers to the idea that God ceased to speak to the Jewish people between Malachi, the last prophet of the Old Testament, and the beginning of the New Testament. However, for Protestants, these years are silent in another way, namely that for many of us, we have no understanding of the events that occurred during them. One of the valuable resources that we have to help fill this gap is the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is a group of Jewish writings that were composed between the Old and New Testaments and can give us valuable insights into the New Testament. Now, Protestants don't consider these books to be canonical like Roman Catholics and Greek Orthodox do, but they can still be very useful to read. In fact, Martin Luther, who is adamant that these books should not be in the canon, still included them in his 1534 Bible. They were in a separate section between the Old and New Testaments with a heading that told the reader that although these works were not to be considered alongside Scripture at the same level, that they were still good and useful to read. Similarly, the King James Bible that John and Charles Wesley would have used contained an apocrypha in the middle of the Testaments and we know from the writings of both men that they were familiar with several of the books from the Apocrypha and even referenced them in their writings. What I want to talk about in this video is not so much what the Apocrypha is, but rather why you should read it. What sorts of insights you, might you gain into the New Testament if you were to pick up the Apocrypha and begin reading? Well, to begin with, you would get a general sense of the history of the period. For instance, 1 and 2 Maccabees are some of our most valuable resources for reconstructing the events of this period. Together, these books tell the story of how the Jews came under Greek rule in the wake of Alexander the Great's death, how they experienced incredible persecution under this Gentile leadership, and how eventually they fought their way to freedom under the leadership of a priestly family named the Maccabees. In addition to this broad historical knowledge, though, the Apocrypha can help us with an understanding of several elements of the New Testament. For instance, have you ever wondered why things like Torah observance and circumcision and food laws are such key issues in the New Testament? Well, as it turns out, when the Greek ruler Antiochus Epiphanes began persecuting the Jews in the second century, some of the things that he went for first were these Jewish practices and Jewish beliefs that were so dear to them. For instance, he burned books of the Torah. He banned circumcision. He told the Jews that they couldn't eat the foods that they were supposed to eat according to the law. And many Jews decided that they were willing to die rather than change their lifestyle, rather than be unfaithful to their God. In fact, we have the stories of some of these Jews, these Maccabean martyrs, preserved in 2 Maccabees 6-7. The old man Eleazar, an old righteous Jewish man, is given the choice between eating pig and dying, a horrible death at the hands of torturers. And he gladly chooses death because he says he wants to be an example of faithfulness to those who are going to follow him. In the very next chapter, they bring in a mother and her seven sons, and they're given the same choice. Will you eat pig or will you die by torture? And one by one, each of the sons chooses death rather than being unfaithful. And finally, the mother dies as well. When I preach passages like Galatians 2, I find passages like this in the Apocrypha incredibly helpful. Because they give us an understanding into why, for instance, someone like Peter, this is the situation in Galatians 2, Peter becomes afraid because some of the circumcision party come down from Jerusalem and Peter stops eating with the Gentiles because he's worried about the, the circumcision party. Paul rebukes and reminds him of what the truth of the gospel is, says you must return to the truth of the gospel. Why is it that the circumcision party exists at all? Why is it that Peter has such a hard time moving from this life that is defined by works to a life that's defined by faith in the Messiah? Well, it's because there's a story to it. Because people have died. Jews have died for things like circumcision. Jews have died for things like food laws just in the last several centuries. And so this gives us an insight into how difficult it must have been for Jewish Christians to move from a life defined by works of the law to a life defined by faith 
in the Messiah. Another way that the Apocrypha can help us is by filling in conceptual gaps between the Testaments. For instance, you'll notice in the Gospels, Jesus goes around casting out demons left and right. But we don't have many instances of demons in the Old Testament. They're just a handful. The book of Tobit can help us understand some of the developments and thought that happened during the intertestamental period. For instance, in Tobit, the righteous young Jewish woman, Sarah, has trouble keeping a husband because every time she gets married, and this has happened seven times, the wicked demon Asmodeus comes and kills her husband before they have a chance to consummate the marriage. She cries out to God for help, and God sends the angel Raphael to help her. Raphael hooks her up with a nice young Jewish boy named Tobias, and he also gives Tobias some magical charms that he can use to ward off the demons. On their wedding night, Tobias uses these charms to frighten the demon away, and then Raphael goes and hunts him down and binds him. Now, I think this can give us some insight into the Gospels, especially, for instance, Mark 1, where Jesus goes into the synagogue and casts out, a man with, uh, or casts out an evil spirit from a man. And then the people are just amazed. They say, oh, look what authority he has. He commands the demons and they obey him. Why are they amazed? Well, perhaps because Jesus isn't using charms. All he does is speak and the demons obey him. In addition, the whole idea of binding a demon that we find in Tobit can help us understand the idea of binding a strong man that Jesus talks about in the Gospels. A final area that the Apocrypha can help us with is understanding nuances and ideas that we might not be aware of otherwise in the New Testament. For instance, in the Gospels we find Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners. Why tax collectors and sinners? Have you ever wondered? Well, as it turns out, in 1 and 2 Maccabees, sinners is not a word that's just used for immoral people in general, but specifically Jews who have forsaken the law of Moses. And if this is the appropriate background for the Gospels, then what this would mean is that when Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners, he's eating with two groups of people who are at the margins of Judaism. People who have put themselves outside of the people of God because they have either not obeyed Torah or they have consorted with the Romans. And I think this helps us to understand a little bit more of what Jesus is doing. He's going out to the lost sheep of Israel, trying to bring in those who have been looked at as outcasts, outsiders, by the Jewish elite. These are just a few of the insights we can gain into the New Testament from reading the Apocrypha. But don't take my word for it. Go ahead and grab a copy for yourself and start reading. 